Darkness is not an affirmative force. It simply reoccupies the space vacated by the light. This is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. It should be uncomfortable for a believer to live as a hypocrite. Delivering people out of the bondage of mainstream media. And the philosophies of this world. God has called you and me to be his ambassadors. Even in this dark moment. Let's not miss our moment. And now, the Hamilton Corner. Good evening. Welcome to the Hamilton Corner here on American Family Radio. I'm your host, Abraham Hamilton III. J. Mack is man of the controls. Producer extraordinaire, often imitated, but never, 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 never duplicated. And we are ready to rock and roll with today's edition of the program. At this very moment, many of you, if not most of you, are transitioning from your part-time jobs where you generate an income to your full-time jobs where you cultivate an outcome. And as you do so, I want to encourage you and to remind you uh, of the reality that family is the first human institution that God ordained and established with marriage at the center. The first command that God gave to mankind was issued within the familial context. Before you have monarchies, before you have orders of priests, before you have orders of prophets, before you have the establishment of the modern civil government, the first human institution the Lord establishes is the family. And he did that intentionally and recorded it uh, for his posterity and for our edification so that we would know the primacy that he places on family. It is the institution. God ordained family as the primary multi-generational discipleship mechanism that exists. This is why when you search the scriptures, you'll find that the responsibility to make disciples of children born into Christian households, it's not the responsibility of the church corporately. It is not the responsibility of your favorite youth pastor. The first response, the first uh, persons who are responsible for evangelizing, catechizing, and making disciples of the children born into Christian families are the parents. The parents. We as parents are responsible for this. This is why we should recognize that no matter where you are, if God has blessed you to be a parent, you are called to be a disciple maker. Now, the commitment is required of us, not because we can guarantee by our investment uh, what the receipt of that investment will be. We cannot guarantee that our children will be born again, but what we are required to do is to be faithful and obedient. You and me will be held accountable. We will be held accountable by God for the quality with which, the degree to with which we have been obedient and faithful to him as we have shepherded his heritage. Our commitment is to faithfulness and obedience, not to outcomes. God, God calls us to be faithful, to be faithful. And if you really want to know what the larger story of the American uh, regression has been, it has been the story frankly, of the world being more passionately committed to multi-generational discipleship than the body of Christ. If you want to drill right down to it, that is what has happened. Now, thanks be to God, uh, that does not have to continue to be the case because as we uh, submit ourselves afresh to the truth of God's word, because we submit ourselves afresh to the God of his word, uh, we have the opportunity to repent and as far as it concerns you and me personally and individually, we can implement the evidence of that repentance, right, starting right in our own homes. When, when Jesus gave the disciples the Great Commission, he instructed them that they were to be his witnesses. You can do it with power to be my witnesses in Ju Judea, in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Now, I'm not saying that all of them were from uh, Judea as a homeland, but it established, it served as the foundation, the base, if you will, for uh, ministry there. And so what, what the Lord was conveying is that you start at the home base first and you work outward from there. Well, we have the opportunities to start with our commitment to execute our King's commission at our home base. And so I want to encourage you to do so. This is why I describe what we do to generate revenue, to generate income, 
as our part-time work because our full-time work as Christ followers is to first and foremost live the lifestyle of worship, which is typified by obedience. The most immediate outflow of that obedience following our personal commitment to holiness is to execute our Lord's commission right at our home base, starting at our home base. All right. To the word of God we go, man. I'm excited about today's show. I'm excited about it. But we're going to begin in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Just one verse for today. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. And the apostle Paul is writing, and here he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard to you. The Apostle Paul said something, I'm sorry, the Apostle Peter said something very similar. Uh, For me to reiterate what I've said to you previously is a safeguard for you. What I want to share, and I've, I've mentioned this on this program before, is that we have to resist the human temptation to always want to have something new. We, we, we shared that already. We, we, we need to have something new. You know, the Apostle Jude said that the faith has been once and for all passed down to us, his saints. You actually should be wary when somebody comes to you saying, hey, man, look, they got this new thing to add to you for the gospel. Uh, ain't no new gospel, chief. <laughs> ain't no new gospel. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, if I or an angel show up presenting you another gospel, let him be accursed. There's no new gospel. The faith that we have has been once and for all passed down to the saints. That is millennia old, millennia old, and repeating the truths of Scripture, giving what God has given us in his word that the Lord has established for our benefit. It is no trouble should be for the believer. And as the Apostle Paul articulates it here in chapter 3, verse 1 in the epistle to the Philippians, that it is a safe Guard. So as you go about your lives and, and you're engaging in executing our Lord's commission and making disciples, starting first with your children, do not grow weary of repeating the same eternal truths from God's word that you may have spoken before. Just because you've said it doesn't mean that it's been caught. One of the things that's necessary in endeavoring to inculcate faith in our children is repetition. When the scripture says, as the Apostle Paul is writing to the Romans, says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What may not be obvious is that the tense that is employed there, as the phrase rendered comes by hearing, what is included in the Greek rendering of this this verbiage is that it comes by hearing with repetition, repeatedly. Over and over and over, not to be mundane, not to be monotonous, not to be uh, redundant for the sake of redundancy. But when you have the eternal truth of God accessible to you, it is incumbent upon us not merely to read it, not merely to go over it, but as as David said, to meditate on it, to meditate on it day and night. There is great safeguard available to us when we repeat the eternal truths of God's word. You can never discuss the fruit of the spirit too much. You can never discuss God's righteous requirement too much. You can never reiterate the fact that God has expectations and standards for his covenant people. You know, I've been talking a bit and I shared some of this at the Marriage Family Life Conference 2023. Um, When you see the entirety of scripture, you know, and a lot of people are familiar with the account when Uzzah touches the ark and the ark stumbled. And there's a great temptation to, you know, impose upon God and impose upon his word an eisegetical humanistic morality. You know, what's going on there? Like, well, that's so mean. Uzzah didn't even, was, Uzzah didn't do nobody nothing, you know. But if you survey the scripture and you delve a bit deeper, you'll find what God is revealing of himself and what God is revealing of mankind, and what God is revealing of his requirements for his covenant people. You, you'll recall that under Saul, the Philistines defeated the Israelites and, and took the Ark of the Covenant, you know. And the Ark was in the Philistine territory for seven months, the scripture records. And the Philistines initially misinterpreted their temporary military victory because they thought because they had defeated the Israelite army, that also that had meant that the God of Israel had been defeated. To which, 
Q. Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. You know, simply because the Lord allowed the Philistine army at that juncture to serve as the means of discipline for Israel doesn't mean that they had toppled God from his throne. So when they initially got the Ark of the Covenant and put it in uh, the temple of their pagan god, Dagon, they came back in later on and found, oh, the, the, the statue had fallen. They tried to put the statue back up, picked it up again, came back again later, it fell again. This time, the head was lopped off of the statue. Then they begin to realize, uh oh, it seems like this may be the doings of the God of Israel. So for seven months, they, they, they circulated the Ark of the Covenant through various Egypt, uh, Egyptian, Philistine cities. And there were plagues broke out, almost like the plagues in Egypt. And it had plagues of mice and you had plagues of tumors. And the tumors were, weren't merely internal growths, they were actually external. The reason why we know this is that the, the, the Philistines, when they began to surmise what's going on, speculative what's going on, they, believe, they started to say, wait a minute, this must be the God of Israel. So they said, we need to make an offering, a peace offering to the God of Israel. And they, they made golden replicas of the mice and, and the tumors, indicating that they recognized, well, we, we see this, this is what you're doing. And the Bible says that they opened the ark and put it inside. Now, you know the commands that the Lord gave the people of Israel concerning the ark that they weren't to open it. Not only that, they went further and said, man, if this is really the God of Israel, what we're going to do, we're going to take a nursing cow. A, a, a cow mom that just had her baby calf and she's nursing because we know nursing cows not trying to be anywhere separate from their babies. So they made the decision. We're going to hitch a nursing, nursing cow to a cart and allow the cart to go. And we'll see because if this is in fact the God of Israel, the cow was going to make a beeline straight for the Israelite territory. And lo and behold, what happens? They put the nursing cow, attach her to the cart. As soon as she's attached, the cow instantly takes off from Philistine territory, walking toward the land of Israel. The Philistines put spies to watch the cart as it traveled. And they follow, say, oh, snap, the, the cow is walking towards Israel. And the cow walks all the way until it gets to the border, the territory between the Philistine territory and the na nation of Israel and stops and stands there. That's all in your Bible. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 4 all the way to verse chapter 7. Stops and stands there. In all of that, the Lord is revealing he didn't have an issue with carts. And then even his issue doesn't prevent the Philistines from opening the ark and putting their pagan, ignorant offerings into it. But when you contrast that with what transpired with the Israelites, the Lord is revealing that he has heightened recoverment, heightened requirements for his covenant people. He's revealing what also that Aaron learned in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3, and those who draw near me, I must be regarded as holy. My covenant people, the Levites, were to carry the presence of God in the ark on their shoulders to bear up under the weight. There's a heightened recoverment, heightened requirement for God's covenant people. Repetition of this phenomenon is a safeguard. It's a safeguard. It's not something that's to be, well, I just want to remain estranged from the Lord. Because here we are in the New Testament context where John chapter 3, verse 16 is often quoted. But John chapter 3, verse 17 is also in the Bible. And it says, for those who reject the Christ, they are condemned already. The condemnation is a rejection of the Messiah who's been offered as a free gift, whose atoning sacrifice makes salvation available to whosoever will let them come. Don't be afraid or dismayed or tempted into thinking that repetition is just boring. Same old, same old. We need the freshest, latest, newest, something new. Hip, skip, hoppity, boop, doop, boop. Repetition is a blessing and it's a safeguard when it's repetition of the eternal truths of God's word. There's a reason 
why all throughout the scripture, Genesis to Revelation, the Lord says to his people over and over and over again, remember. Whether it's a story about prayer in public schools or battles for biblical truth within our denominations, the American Family News Network is here to tell you what the newsmakers are saying. We are starting to see a rebellion against corporate America's endorsement coddling of the LGBTQ agenda. The American Family News Network is comprised of news anchors and editors that team up to bring you news from a Christian perspective. A TRO for non-legal types out there uh, is basically just an emergency order that would have allowed Liam to go back to school wearing the t-shirt he wants to wear. And again, that t-shirt says there are two genders. Not only can you listen to reports on the radio, but you can also visit AFN.net for coverage of the latest headlines. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis out on the campaign trail was ready with an answer on the meaning of the word woke. American Family News, reporters you can trust. Some guy who claims to be a girl is not science. I'm sorry. You no, it's not. You just can't claim to be something that you're not. No, we don't allow people to choose their ethnicity. No. Or and, their age. No, I can't say I'm, you know, I'm an Eskimo, so provide me with a free igloo. We yeah. don't let people do that. We don't. You're a male, and you can't claim to be a female, because you're not. Today's Issues, weekday mornings at 11 Eastern and 10 Central on American Family Radio. Sometimes shortcuts are not wise. If that's true physically, how true that might be spiritually. I think all of us have shortcut stories, you know? (laughs) But there are some you don't want to shortcut when it comes to getting to God, do you? There is no shortcut to God. It's only through Jesus. Exploring Missions with Bert and Nathan Harper. Saturday afternoons at 2.30 Central and Sundays at 1 Central on American Family Radio. Shining light into the darkness, this is the Hamilton Corner on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. Abraham Hamilton III here. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to have on the program with me none other than Tim Barton, president of Wall Builders. If you are not familiar with Wall Builders, where have you been? Come out from under the rock where you have been Sleeping. Wall Builders is an organization dedicated to presenting America's forgotten history and heroes with an emphasis on the moral, religious, and constitutional foundation on which America has been constructed. Tim Barton is a brother in Christ. He is a husband. He is a father. He's a man of God. And frankly, he and his family have been a tremendous blessing to our nation and a blessing to me personally. It is my honor to have on the program. Mr. Tim Barton. Thank you for joining me, Tim. Man, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Oh, man, the pleasure is certainly, certainly mine. I know you've heard me share this story numerous times, uh, but I'm, I'm, do- I'm going to share it now for the audience. I will never forget I was 14 or 15 years old at my church in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I remember coming to service. Our, our, we had two Sunday morning services at that time. Our larger service was actually a 7 a.m. service, so I would get there at 6.30, and I remember seeing a man putting these huge books across the entire front of the platform. Didn't know who he was. And I was just intrigued from that portion on. And the man, I learned his name later. His name was David Barton. And he did a series of sermons, really, and lectures on America's Forgotten History. And so that helped shape the trajectory of my life uh, and the the way that God ended up moving me. And so I get to talk to you now who is the president of the organization that your dad founded uh and you have your unique gifts talents and abilities as you take as you taken the helm of the organization and so i wanted to have you on the hamilton corner uh just to present our audience here with an opportunity to learn some things about america's forgotten history i would argue sometimes intentionally concealed history uh, but what are some of the things that from our history and founding that you think are pertinent and necessary for every american to be aware of well, I, I appreciate the setup, uh, and, and also I want to maybe tie a little bow, kind of connect some of the dots in that story, too. So as you mentioned, my dad was setting out all these old books on the stage. Uh, we've been very blessed over the last 30, uh, 35 years, give or take, 
Uh, we've been able to compile what's considered one of the largest private collections of original documents from the founding era. And as we try to present history, we go back to the original documents. We actually have letters and journals and diaries from guys like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and John Hancock and, and Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, all the noted names of founding fathers. We actually have their writings. And what, what makes it different is in the modern I guess, academic kind of movement, we've been told that just trust the experts, right? We mm. definitely heard this a lot during COVID, but it's true in the academic world as well. We're told, right, just these professors, they, they have all knowledge. They're all knowing. Just trust what they say. Do what they do. And when, when my dad first started actually reading some original documents back in the 80s, he was blown away by how different it was from what he had originally heard. Mm. And he realized that the founding fathers, contrary to the notion of a separation of church and state, that they didn't want to secularize America. They had actually worked to keep God at the center of what we were doing in America. And, and he found this in their writings. He found this in their letters, which is just incredibly evident if you actually study their writings. With that being said, one of the things that he really felt the challenge of God was a little bit like the story of Nehemiah from the Bible, where Nehemiah was part of the Israelites when they're in that Babylonian captivity. And, and, and Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king, but he saw Jerusalem torn down and said, man, we, we need to help restore our nation. And Nehemiah, with the blessing of the king, goes back and rebuilds Jerusalem. And in Nehemiah 2.17, he says, come, let us rebuild the walls that we may no longer be reproached to the people. And God really felt like that was the kind of his calling, that the, the verse of our organization, of our ministry, was that God was calling us to rebuild the walls of America, which is where the name Wall Builders came from. Mm-hmm. And so with that being said, as we look at, at the original documents and study history, it is crazy to me where the modern conversation has gone, that right now only 18% of, of young people, the rising generation, only 18% say they're proud to be American. Mm. Um, in fact, we now are a little below 50% of Americans that are proud to be Americans. And it's not just because maybe we have political leaders that we disagree with. It's because for decades, we have been learning in schools, learning in, in all kinds of academic and educational structures that America is fundamentally evil, that we've done more bad than we've done good. And, and that's why if you talk to students today, they can tell you more bad things about America than good things about America, which can only be correct based on their perspective. If you go to any third world nation, and what I always tell parents and young people is if you want to help your young people out, young people, if you want to help yourself out, find a church that takes mission trips to third world nations. And go on a two-week mission trip. Go, go see what life looks like in the rest of the world, mm. because you can't have a proper perspective of the uniqueness and, and the blessings of America if you don't recognize the challenges the rest of the world is facing at unprecedented levels compared to what Americans deal with. Uh, so what we try to do is, is just tell the honest story. We, we think it's more of the biblical approach. We're in the Bible. If you read the Old Testament, it shows the good, the bad, and the ugly. It shows mm-hmm. in, in Israel, there were great kings, and there were awful kings, evil kings. Some of the kings had really good moments and then had really bad moments, but the Bible unapologetically tells the whole story. The modern narrative today is we're only learning a part of the story, and the part of the story we're learning is not even always the true story, but the part of the story we're learning is how bad America is, and that's just fundamentally not correct in context and perspective. It's not historically accurate. And so we try to restore some of the truth of American history, not saying that America didn't make mistakes, not saying that there weren't evil leaders at times who did evil things, but it's recognizing that what America is being accused of is different than the reality of what she did. Most of the sins today that people accuse America of are not the sins she was guilty of. We, we committed plenty of sins. It's just maybe not the ones we're being accused of at the level that we're being accused of them, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And, man, you said so much that was— uh, uh, valuable in what you just shared, but one of the main things you said is original source, <laughs> original sources, not just parroting what, what what is heard from someone whose grandmama, whose un- uncle said this about the nation, but looking at the original documentation. And and so one, one of the major things, and I, I guess let's just hit this right from the beginning. I have more things I want to get into, uh, but one of, in my estimation, uh, the heroic, salient, and uh, estimable families in American history that I believe every American needs to be aware of is the family of John Adams, the, the real Adams family. Uh, would you share the, <laughs> with our listeners and our viewers a bit about the reality of the legacy of the Adams family? Absolutely. And, and to your point, they are one of the more forgotten families that are arguably 
arguably the most significant family yes. as far as a legacy goes in American history. Mm-hmm. Uh, because certainly you can look at, at, at people that were noted, whether it be a George Washington, whether it be a Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, you can look at people that were very important, but their family legacy didn't always uh, continue to the same level as what, for example, John Adams, he's, he's the first vice president, becomes the second president of America. Well, his son, John Quincy Adams, becomes the sixth president of America. And then also kind of worth note, John Adams is the guy that during the American Revolution, he is the American ambassador over to Great Britain. He's one of the guys who helps negotiate the end of the American Revolution. Well, John Quincy Adams is the American ambassador during the War of 1812. Again, another war with Great Britain under President Madison. John Quincy Adams is the American ambassador to Great Britain who negotiates the end of the War of 1812. And then quite interestingly, John Quincy Adams' son, Charles Francis Adams, is an ambassador over to Great Britain, this time during the Civil War. And this one is also a super interesting connection uh, as far as some of the history details that during the Civil War, uh, the, the Confederate states were courting uh, Great Britain, were courting France, were trying to find allies, because for the North, that's where so much immigration was happening. And so they were able to continue to grow their army and, and build their army through new immigrants coming in. But the South, they didn't have the, the immigration stations the same way they did up North. And so they're struggling to grow their army. And as battles are happening, their armies are being depleted. They need more supplies. So they begin courting Great Britain and France, among others that they're putting out requests for help to. And Great Britain and France are are pretty close to, it looks like, at least historically on paper, it looks like they're getting close to maybe siding with the Confederates, saying, you know what, we're going to be with you because uh, we never liked those northern guys anyway. We're, we're going to help you out in this. Charles Francis Adams goes to them and says, guys, you, you ought to hold on for a little bit. There, there's something bigger at play um, right. This isn't this isn't merely a state's rights issue. This is not merely an internal conflict. This is something much bigger. And he began to tell them that one of the fundamental issues in the Civil War was the issue of slavery. And he explained to them, if you'll wait just a little bit, that President Lincoln is going to make it very, very clear. Well, President Lincoln comes out with the Emancipation Proclamation when at that point it's very clear that this internal conflict, that the, the major component in this is a slavery component. At that point, Great Britain and France, they've already ended slavery. They, they, they had been against the slave trade a long time, and so they come out and say, okay, if it's slavery, we're not supporting a nation or, or right, a, a startup nation, so to speak, a confederacy that is wanting to extend slavery, so we're off. What is quite remarkable is John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and Charles Francis Adams, all of them negotiated helping America find peace in the midst of major conflicts, but also – All three of them were major anti-slavery advocates. Another Mm -hmm. thing that's largely overlooked, when people talk about the Founding Fathers, and and Abe, you hear this all the time. Yes. Uh, It's something, and obviously in our circles, when we are are people that are helping share news and and, and, uh, kind of, and and some level, create truthful narratives as opposed to uh, a lot of the dishonesty. And so there's a dichotomy of what we're trying to show people, like this is what actually happened, that this is the truth, helping people navigate what that is. There is so much nonsense being espoused, uh, one of them, about how the, the accusations that all the founding fathers or all of America was racist, right? This is one of the things certainly parroted by the 1619 Project. It's something mm-hmm. that critical race theory largely teaches, that all the founding fathers were racist, evil individuals. And, and although, in, in like full disclosure, right, telling the whole story, the good, the bad, the ugly, in full disclosure, there certainly were some racist founding fathers. Mm-hmm. However, the majority of them were not racist, and— you also have examples of guys like John Adams, someone who never owned slaves and fought against slavery his entire life. Well, John Adams raises his son, John Quincy Adams, in the midst of the American Revolution. And, and John Adams also, uh, a lot of background in his story, and we could spend um, hours on any one of their stories, whether it be John Adams or John Quincy or, or Charles Francis, and obviously we don't have time for that. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on John Quincy because his story is so fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but John Adams makes himself a noted name as an attorney. Uh, he, he is a firebrand speaking out for uh, freedom uh, against tyranny and oppression. Well, as the revolution unfolds, he's a major voice in the Continental Congress. His family is growing up, and they're in Massachusetts. As they grow up, the family, Abigail, his wife, and then his son, John Quincy Adams, they're actually at the Battle of Bunker Hill. They're watching from a the hillside. They watch their family doctor, their personal friend, Dr. Joseph Warren, 
get murdered in essence by the British. She was wounded in the battle, and after the battle was over, they came over and they bayoneted him to death. They were not going to get him medical help. They said, "Nope, we're killing this dude." So he's literally murdered on the battlefield at that point because the, the battle, right in essence, like he's he's done. He's out of fight. Uh, anyway, so this is when John Quincy Adams is eight years old. As the the war unfolds, it is very evident in John Adams' mind that this is this is really on our family's doorstep, and we're we're going to be part of this bloody conflict whether we want to or not. So the Massachusetts Minutemen, one of the places they would do drills was in front of John Adams' home. And at one point, John Adams tells John Quincy Adams, hey, you got to get your musket. You, you need to get out there. you got to start learning how to, how to work the musket, learning how to do this, because before you know it, you might need this skill. He's only eight years old, and, and he's out training with the military as an eight-year-old. Mm. When he's 10 years old, John Adams uh, is going on a diplomatic mission over to France, and John Quincy Adams uh, escorts his father. He's actually the official secretary for the delegation for his mm-hmm. father uh, when he's 14 years old. He gets a second assignment from Congress. Congress actually assigns a 14-year-old as part of a, a ambassador delegation over to Russia. Well, the reason John Quincy Adams got the assignment is as a 14-year-old, he was already fluent in six languages. Uh, he ends up being over in Europe a lot with his father as the revolution comes to an end. Uh, John Adams is actually over in Europe while the Constitution is written. Then when George Washington becomes president, he's chosen vice president. He comes back. Well, when George Washington is looking for ambassadors, he was so impressed. John Quincy Adams had done some writing, and it was printed in the paper. George Washington read it said, this kid's amazing. It, it, and actually, Washington didn't know who it was at first. He said, this writer is amazing. Come to find out, it was John Adams' son, who mm. at the time is 19, 20 years old. And wow. Washington at this point like, right, like, this, this kid's amazing. Who is this guy? Washington assigns him to go be an ambassador for America. And while he's over in, in Europe— Washington actually writes about him that he is the best ambassador that America has. He, he is the, the best guy we have over in Europe. Uh, when John Adams becomes president, John Quincy Adams is an ambassador under his father. When Jefferson becomes president, John Quincy Adams is elected to be a U.S. senator. When Madison became president, he recruited Adams again to come back and be an ambassador, uh, which I mentioned he negotiated the end of the War of 1812. When Monroe became president, he became the Secretary of State under Monroe, mm-hmm. and then John Quincy Adams became the sixth president of the United States of America, <laughs> which is arguably the most impressive resume of any president ever, especially when it comes to a guy who personally knew every single founding father, or it was mentored by guys like George Washington, just absolutely amazing. After being president, though, he, he lost to Andrew Jackson, and he was, at that point, John Quincy is trying to figure out what's he going to do with his life, because he still has a lot of passion, but what, what can he do to make a difference? And he ends up being elected to Congress. He wasn't even running. He was recruited. His name was put on the ballot. He was not campaigning. He wasn't running, but his state chose him to be a congressman. And he decided that there was a great evil that needed to be remedied, and it was the evil of slavery. He became the leader of the anti-slavery movement in Congress. And for 17 years, he fought against slavery. Uh, interestingly, his last year in Congress, that, which – just for everybody listening to remember congress every two years you have elections in congress and so as he's there uh, for in essence roughly nine terms um he died in his, his ninth term there but as he's there for all these terms he's seeing new people elected every two years his last term there was a young freshman elected who became a a member of the anti-slavery movement let me let, was- me let me interrupt you right there because the music music is coming on and guys you want to stay close because you want to hear this connection but the reality is John Quincy Adams can can rightly be described, in my opinion, as an American William Wilberforce in a lot of ways. But I'm going to pause right here because I want you to see the connection that Tim is going to make to show the, the, the continuity of the anti-slavery slavery movement in America led so long by John Quincy Adams. And you want to see who his successor may be. Some Christians have become desensitized to the simple gospel. While we're busy by waiting on miracles, we're missing out on simply knowing Jesus. When our relationship with Him looks more like a to-do list, we're depriving ourselves of freedom. Let's be more mindful of the presence of God in the mundane. Let's just love Jesus and let Him love us back. To read the full blog, The Simple Gospel by Lauren Bragg, visit afa.net forward slash the stand. afa.net forward slash the stand. 
There's only four things that we can do with money. Live, give, owe, and grow. There's three key categories that are indicators of financial health. Our housing, our car, and our food. What that comes down to is competing priorities for our income. For more biblical wisdom on financial stewardship, listen to Faith and Finance with Rob West weekdays at 9 a.m. Central. How does our use of God's resources truly reflect what's most important to us? Sadly, as believers, we can be pretty self-centered and selfish about our prayers, praying for I, me, mine. The Lord taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. It says, Our Father, not just simply my Father, but our Father. We need to pray much daily for each other and pray with one another as well. That's so, so very important for each and every one of us. Tune in to the Hour of Intercession, weekdays at 3 a.m. Central on American Family Radio. The Hamilton Quarter Podcast and One Minute Commentaries are available at AFR.net. Back to the Hamilton Quarter on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the Hamilton Corner. My guest is President of Wall Builders, Tim Barton. He was explaining the life and legacy of the Adams family, and we're focusing specifically at this point on John Quincy Adams, and we got right to the point to where after being president, I mean, a remarkable teenager, you're talking about fluent in six languages by the time he's 14, you know, serving as a foreign ambassador. Uh, his writings impressed George Washington so much so, George Washington is like, who is this cat? He learns that this is a young man. Kind of gives you a lot of a different perception of adolescence in that time period versus where we are today. Uh, but after being president uh, and then then at being six pre- the sixth president of the United States, uh, losing a subsequent election but still recognizing that there's more that needs to be done. There's a great evil that must be eradicated. He takes on the mantle of the anti-slavery movement in Congress for roughly nine terms, 17 years. And so that's where we left off before the break. And Tim, I'll toss it back to you uh, to pick up right there to continue uh, to, to, to put a, a, a button on John Quincy Adams' uh, story. Perfect. So as, as John Quincy Adams is in Congress, he becomes a leader of the anti-slavery movement. And, 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 and also, John Quincy Adams was an attorney. His father had been an attorney, and they were both very good attorneys. John Quincy Adams actually argued many cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. One of the cases worth mentioning happened while he was in Congress. And he was a very, very famous person, as you might imagine, the guy who knew every founding father personally, who served under virtually every single presidential administration, or at least was a U.S. Senator under Jefferson, but every other president's administration. He was part of the team. He's part of the staff. This is a very noted, famous guy. There was a very famous anti-slavery case, and it was called the Amistad case. And, mm-hmm. uh, of course, if you know about this, for everybody listening, if you don't know about it, there was a movie Steven Spielberg did back in the 90s, totally worth watching. It'll give yes. you kind of a, a brief uh, overview of the Amistad case. But the essence is there was a group of Africans that were taken on a Portuguese slave trading ship. And at this point, the, the slave trade is illegal. America actually was the first nation to sign a law banning the slave trade. Thomas Jefferson signed that law on March 2nd, 1807. England signed the law three weeks approximately later on March 25th, 1807. And some people might argue, well, actually, England's law was first because when they signed it on March 25th, it went into effect on that date. America signed the law March 2nd, which they signed it first, but it didn't go into effect until January 1st of the following year. So people argue that actually England was the first nation to ban the slave trade. I would actually throw a caveat and say, no, I don't think they were. I still think America was the first nation because even though America's law didn't go into effect until January 1st, 1808, England's law that was 1807, March 25th, their law said that if there's any ship captain who has contracts in the the slave trade industry, he has one year to fulfill the contracts, and then there can be no more contracts taken, no more slave trade after one year. So they didn't actually ban it until March 25th. 1808. So America signed the law first. America banned it first. All that the context to say that as the Amistad case happens, there is a, a Portuguese slave trading ship, and they're going to Cuba. Uh, they, they sell slaves in Cuba. Then there's a, uh, a couple of plantation owners that bought 53 slaves. They're taking them to their plantation uh, in the Caribbean. Well, on the way, these 53 uh, Africans who were enslaved, they have an uprising on the ship. They kill the crew. They keep a couple people alive because they, they, these Africans did not know how to sell this large, massive ship. 
And so they tell them, right, take us back to Africa. And so these sailors, they kept alive, say, okay, we, we will take you back. What they do is they end up sailing up the coast of America, and they end up stopping in Connecticut. As they stop in Connecticut, they go into harbor, uh, they go into port. And when they get there, these sailors begin crying mutiny. There's a mutiny on the high seas. And so Americans come, and mutiny is an offense that's the death penalty. You, you, this is totally illegal, and you get put to death for doing mutiny. Well, as Connecticut, they were an anti-slavery state. The slave trade's been banned for decades in America. And when they begin to find out what's going on, now, first of all, they, they imprison all the Africans, uh, uh, charging them with the crime of mutiny. But as, as information begins to unfold, which, first of all, no one in Connecticut spoke the this African dialect, I think it was Mindy, I think is what it was, but they didn't speak this African dialect. So th- they start looking for someone. They find someone who was a, a former British uh, sailor who actually had been from that nation. Um, and uh, anyway, found freedom, was living in America. And he came down, he began translating. And as the story came out that these were individuals who were taken in the slave trade, which Americans now already have a distaste for the slave trade, Mm -hmm. that they were kidnapped. These were free individuals who were kidnapped in Africa, who were sold in the slave trade, and the revolt on board, they were fighting for their freedom. At this point, the argument was that this this wasn't mutiny, this was self-defense. Well, they win the the case at the lower court. It then is appealed to the Supreme Court. As it's appealed, and by the way, uh, Spain was helping fund this uh, because these plantation owners uh, were from Spain, connected to Spain. So Spain is helping fund the pro-slavery side of this. And as it goes to the Supreme Court, the most famous anti-slavery leader of the time is John Quincy Adams, a guy who actually has argued Supreme Court cases. And so they recruit him. He was known as old man eloquent, mm-hmm. uh, kind of a, a, a descriptor. Um, whenever he would get them to speak in Congress, everybody, no matter what was going on, everybody stopped, everybody came in from the halls. They, even if they disagreed with this guy, John Quincy Adams was just so brilliant. Everybody wanted to hear the wisdom of his words, even if they disagreed with the principle, even if they disagreed politically, they wanted to hear the brilliance of this guy. So he's chosen. He goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court at the time, the justices were the majority of them. I think it was like seven of the nine were, were slaveholding justices. So <laughs> you're arguing in slavery in front of people that have slaves. It's not looking good. He ends up winning the decision with only one judge voting against them. The Africans mm-hmm. win their freedom. Anyway, this is part of his legacy. He's fought mm-hmm. against slavery his entire life. His last term in Congress, there's a freshman who is elected. This freshman joins the anti-slavery movement. Here's the speech of John Quincy Adams. Uh, you can imagine is inspired by the wisdom of his words. Well, John Quincy Adams has a stroke. He dies in Congress. When he dies, the, the void is now very evident in the anti-slavery movement. And, and, and the movement is still incredibly strong, but the most noted leader, the, the, the spokesman is gone. And so there's a lot of people now thinking, we want to help fill that gap. We, we want to fill the void. And this young freshman runs for re-election, and he lost, but not to be discouraged. This freshman congressman that decided he's, he's, he's going to try again and will lose again. He runs for Senate. He lost for Senate. He, he ran for state office, lost state office. This young freshman did not win another election until he won the 1860 presidency, and it was Abraham Lincoln. Mm-hmm. And what is so fascinating about some of these connections is not only does Abraham Lincoln become the president that ends slavery, Abraham Lincoln also appoints John Quincy Adams' son, Charles Francis Adams, to be the ambassador over to Great Britain, over to Europe, who is another anti-slavery guy. When John Quincy Adams does the Emancipation Proclamation, that is literally something that John Quincy Adams had been talking about. One of the strategies of how could you do this? Well, if slaves were rebelling, what could you do? And then you actually can start in Washington, D.C., because you have the federal authority over the District of Columbia, because that's a, a, a federal territory. And mm-hmm. then everything John Quincy Adams laid out in his plan is strategy is what Abraham Lincoln did. And Abraham Lincoln gets the credit and and justifiably deserves credit for ending slavery in America. But it overlooks the fact that his mentor, that even people he chose as ambassador, helping to stop the British and the French from joining the Confederacy were the Adams. And and back kind of to the original question is, who are some of the people that are overlooked or people that we should know that we don't, that maybe if we knew their story, it might even change some of the perspective we have of America. Mm -hmm. The Adams family is a family that by and large, people don't know their story today. 
And if we knew their story, it would give us such a different perspective from the modern narrative. Also worth noting is that the Adams family were very outspoken in their faith. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Quincy Adams was very outspoken as a Christian, which also, if you look at the anti-slavery movement in America, you will be hard pressed to find any any leader in the anti-slavery movement in America who was not an outspoken Christian and maybe not even being a pastor or a minister on some level. And the reason that matters is even when people look at America and they want to accuse America of being guilty of all these evils and sins, I mentioned in the beginning, there's no question America is guilty of definitely committing evils and sins along the way, not Mm -hmm. always the ones we're accused of, but definitely. We're not a perfect nation. We definitely had leaders that did some evil things. One of the questions worth asking is how do those evils end and and who led the opposition? And without Mm -hmm. exception, and and this is so important for all of our listeners today, without exception, the people that led the opposition to stop the evil things that were being done in America, it was always Christians. It, Mm -hmm. It was always pastors. It was always the religious leaders who based on what the Bible taught, they said, we have to stop this. This is not right for America because it's not what the Bible says, and we should do what the Bible says here in America. The reason evils always stopped were because of Christians. Mm-hmm. Whether we talk about the slavery, uh, slave trade, the, the, the slavery industry in America, whether we talk about civil rights, whether we talk about Indian land removal, you pick any evil you want. And I will point out the Christians, the pastors, the ministers who are the ones leading the opposition – ultimately to stop those things in America. And, and the reason that we would even argue from all builders' perspective that history matters so much is because the more we study history, the more we realize that when Christians who pay attention, who read their Bible, when they get involved in the process, it makes America a more godly nation. It makes America a better nation, which is why we've been able to enjoy so many blessings. And the reason that we are seeing so many problems in our nation today is because for the last many decades, Christians have not been a part of the solution. We have been a part of observing, maybe of complaining, Mm. but we've not been a part of the solution. And if we would study history, we would know that the only way that we can stop this evil is when Christians wake up and get involved and are part of the solution in the process. Mm, Very well said. So in in, in your view, and let me just say this, guys, wallbuilders.com is a website. Wallbuilders.com, it is worthwhile for you to arm yourself with the information and the accurate retelling of history uh, for your families. I use some of the things that, 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 uh, Wall Builders presents and even a, t- a book that Tim wrote uh, as a textbook in, in teaching my children as we uh, disciple our children from home. Uh, so I definitely commend them to you as a resource center uh, to bolster your families in learning an, a, a, a proper view of history for our nation. Uh, but I want to ask you, Tim, why do you think people like John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Charles Francis Adams, the Adams family as a whole, these people have kind of been relegated to or, or sidelined, marginalized, or completely ignored in discussions about American history in our country? I think it would be maybe different answers for different people because okay. I think some people – one of the things that, that I will often tell people is, is in opposition, you deal with two kinds of people in opposition. It's either the intentional or the ignorant. Mm -hmm. And, right, some people just don't know, but some people are – it's maybe more where the Bible talks about casting your pearls before swine, Mm -hmm. right? Like they just – they don't value truth, and so they don't care what is true. They're going to promote their agenda, right? Mm -hmm. Howard Zinn, who 1980 writes his famous book, A People's History of the United States, he was an intentional guy. He knew he was lying about America. He knew he was lying about the Founding Fathers and Christopher Columbus and all these people that today are villainized. He's one of the lead promulgators of those lies. That's where the modern narratives we know today about America and the Founding Fathers being evil, he's the guy that started so many of those lies, or at least repopularized them in the 1980s. Mm. I think some people have ignored the Adams family. Simply, they just didn't know the story, and so they repeat what they know, and they just didn't know the Adams family. But then there are certainly some people who are intellectually dishonest, and because it doesn't fit the narrative they want to promote, right? If, if, for example, if you go back, John Adams was the Committee of Five in, in the original Continental Congress. When they come up with a declaration, John Adams is one of five men, members put in charge of coming up with a declaration. In the original draft of the declaration, the largest grievance in the original draft of the declaration is a grievance against the slave trade and arguing for the humanity and the equality of the enslaved individuals. That was 
arguably being the largest, that was the most significant thing mm-hmm. to Jefferson as he's drafting this, to, to maybe John Adams and Franklin and, and Sherman and Livingston, the, the five guys who are together, as they're putting all these thoughts together, the most significant thing is we have to end the slave trade because these are humans that are being enslaved. And, and in the slave trade, it, it's awful, it's evil. This has to stop. The, the, the reason that becomes significant is that doesn't fit the modern narrative mm-hmm. of the founding fathers maybe didn't like some of the evil of slavery or the slave trade. And people might argue, just to kind of finish some of that thought, they might argue, well, but that didn't make it in the final draft. And the reason was John Hancock, who was the president of Congress, so they would only include in the final draft what was unanimously agreed to. And Georgia and South Carolina both said, we don't think that grievance is necessary. But 11 of the 13 colonies voted in favor of that grievance. The vast majority of the founding fathers were not people that were promoting and wanted to see the expansion of slavery. In fact, the vast majority came out saying that we want to see slavery eradicated, that we want to see the, the abolition of, of slavery in general. And this is where John Adams specifically doesn't fit the modern narrative, mm. where the argument today is that America is fundamentally evil, that America was built on racism, that the founding fathers fought maybe even the revolution to, to <laughs> protect the institution of slavery. That doesn't fit the narrative if you actually know who these people were. And, and, and this is where I think it's also worth just everybody listening. If, if you go and look at the picture, we, we kind of know it as the signers of the Declaration. I got I got to interrupt Tim because we are coming to the end of the program and I don't want the music to cut you off and the show end to cut you off but all this means is that I got to have you back because we have to do a follow up on this wallbuilders.com ladies and gentlemen is where you need to go